Good evening. Welcome to the Lamar University uh, Digital Alumni and Friends Gathering uh, for this evening. We know that, that, that the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting every one of us in many different ways. And we, we realize that many of our alumni and friends are suffering a, a, a lot of bad situations because of the pandemic. And we also know that many of our alumni and friends are on the front lines in the medical professions or in the, uh, the food service professions or, or in, in delivery um, who are, are working on our behalf to, to, to keep our society going during this, this social distancing. And we want all of you to know that you're in our thoughts and in our prayers and that, that we appreciate your efforts. What we decided to do at Lamar is to have a digital alumni and friends gathering in order to continue the uh, relationship we have with our larger communities. So um, we asked some of our distinguished alumni if they would join us on Tuesday nights to talk about their life and what's going on in their careers and in their world. Tonight you have an extraordinary treat um, that, that John Alexander has agreed to be our, 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 um, our speaker tonight. Um, in order to facilitate this, we went to another one of our friends, Betty Moody, and asked her to be a part of this program. Now, many of you know Betty. She has the Moody Gallery in Houston, which has operated continuously since 1975. Um, some of the, the, the nation's most important and influential and um, fun artists have, have had their shows in Betty's galleries. And recently, the Art League of Houston awarded Betty its Lifetime Achievement Award. So we're thrilled to have Betty join us. And we will socially distance. I will move from the seat, and Betty will take over from now. Well, thank you, Juan. Um, John and I have never done anything quite like this before. So all of you out there are going to have to bear with us. Uh, it seems so strange to be seeing John through this computer right here, knowing we're going to have an interview. I have an introduction for you, John, and it is one I wrote out. So I'm going to read it, and then I have lots of questions for you. Uh, this is a treat to be able to visit with you like this and to see your studio back there. So here we go. I truly was honored to be asked to introduce you tonight. Uh, it's a great conversation that we're going to have. Uh, all of our lives have truly been turned upside down with this uh, pandemic. We're living through pretty incredulous times. And so with that being said, I'm in hopes that the program with John and I tonight might provide a small respite for all of you viewers. And I thank all of you for, I guess it's called tuning in. I'm not sure what the terminology is for doing something digital like this, but thank you for being here with us tonight. Uh, John and I have known each other for many years. Uh, I think John moved to Houston probably about 1970 or 71. I moved there in 1969. And at that time, the Houston art community was very, very small. So everybody knew each other. I remember John's work. I think first time I realized what an extraordinary painter he was, was a show that you had at the Contemporary Arts Museum in 1975, I believe it was. And uh, it just stayed with me forever. Uh, I realized what an extraordinary painter you are. And it's uh, the fact that we've been friends all these years and I've seen you grow and change and you, uh, your paintings are move all of us for sure. Um, John had exhibited in museums and galleries nationally and internationally. And I went through his resume and it is one of the most impressive I have ever seen. I counted something like 85 solo exhibitions or maybe more and that was probably selected. Did you know you've had that many solo shows, John? Oh, yes. Of course. Yeah. And then of course in the group shows, my gosh, they've been, uh, I didn't even bother to go through those. He's, um, it's extensive and it's impressive. He is in permanent collections of leading museums, including the Museum of Contemporary Art in LA, Smithsonian Museum of American Art in Washington, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, Dallas Museum of Art, Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and it goes on and on. In fact, the Smithsonian Museum of American Art organized a retrospective exhibition, which opened there in 2007 and traveled to the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston in 2008. Uh, in fact, it was even enlarged, the exhibition was enlarged by Allison and William Green by borrowing pieces from collectors in Houston. But John's roots have always been in Beaumont. He was born and raised in Beaumont and he graduated from Lamar University with his BFA in 1968. He's been recognized as a Lamar University Distinguished Alumnus and serves on the College of Fine Art and Communications Advisory Council. 
In 2003, the then named Dishman Gallery, now the Dishman Art Museum, presented an exhibition titled John Alexander, Recent Observations. And that same year, John Alexander, 35 Years of Watercolors, was exhibited at the Art Museum of Southeast Texas. Fast forward to 2015, and John was the artist honoree for Lamar University's College of Fine Arts, Le Grand Ball. And that same year, the painting studio located in the art building was named in John's honor, the John Alexander Painting Studio. John has been the speaker for the President's Circle event at Lamar University in 2015 and on a panel for the event in 2018. And in 2019, he was the honorary chair for the Art Museum of Southeast Texas Gala honoring James Searles. John's always been a generous person, very giving of himself, and he's always been able to come to Beaumont and speak to the students here uh, easily anytime they needed him. I also wanted to say something about John's generosity to his friends. He's always the first to promote other artists that are friends of his that he respect and other friends of his too. He has sent me friends and clients over the years and um, he's an exceptional human being. He is a force of nature for sure. Nancy Evans had an idea and a vision to start a public art collection at Lamar University that would enhance and enrich the quality of the students' lives and experiences on campus. And her husband, Dr. Kenneth Evans, president of Lamar University, approved of and encouraged the project. Kim Steinhagen, who is still involved in the public collection, worked with Nancy in making this vision a reality. The collection began in 2014 and has grown immensely over the years. The collection today is in depth, it has paintings, sculpture, photographs, works on paper, mosaic installations by leading nationally known artists, and many of the artworks are site specific commissions. It is stunning. And John Alexander is a very large part of it with almost 20 paintings and works on paintings, uh, works on paper included. The painting that is behind me is in this public collection at Lamar University and it's called Davy Jones Locker. John's also been very instrumental in twisting a lot of his collector's arms to donate their John Alexander paintings as well as art by other artists to the collection at Lamar University. John, I'd love for you to speak about the collection at Lamar University and also speak about the Davy Jones locker painting that's behind me. If people can see it, I'll move away so people can see it a little bit better if you'd like. But And after that, I want you to talk about your early years in Beaumont. So. Well, thank you very much for that thoughtful and, and extremely generous, lovely <laughs> uh, introduction. I have to say it's it's such a nice, uh, evening for me to be here in this uh, in this uh, current setting and uh, be able to to get try to get my mind off of what is going on around me. Uh, Absolutely, everybody is struggling, of course, and everybody is uh, in this together. This is uh, a, truly a time when our nation needs to be together and Absolutely. solve this problem together, but. Uh, Certain areas are, are unable to understand what's going on in other areas because they're not there. But in our little county that I'm sitting in right now, Suffolk County in eastern Long Island, it's a, not a particularly big county, uh, we have over 14,000 cases uh, just in this county alone, close oh, to 15. That's now. incredible, John. And oh, that's that. over twice as many as the entire state of Texas. Yes, it is. Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, and so we're we're in a very uh, dangerous area here. I, I worry and worry and worry so much that uh, one thing my wife said to me before we started tonight, uh, she she said, uh, "Don't forget to breathe." So <laughs> well, I, also, my nerves are so shot. But, I'm uh, sure they are. I was, I, you... I was I was coming to. Uh, to the house about a quarter of a mile from here. And I had a FedEx truck was about to pull in my driveway. And so I pulled him over and it was like, he put the package in the back of my pickup. Uh -huh. And then I pulled in the driveway and it was like trying to remove a rat from a, a dead rat from a storage facility or something. I took a shovel <laughs> and I put the pet FedEx package on a shovel. Then I got it in my gate and I transferred that put it on the ground and then I got pliers <laughs> and I picked the FedEx package up with the pliers and took it to the front door and then saturated it with with Lysol well, and still managed to get 
the contents all over my hands. Well, it's, we so, are living during different times for sure, my dear. And everything I do is stressing me out. But tonight, I hope I get uh, at least 45 minutes with all of my friends from Beaumont and people I love wow. and talk people about I care about. Talk about years in Beaumont. Talk about, roots. talk about your roots here in Beaumont. Talk about when you grew up here, because I know this place has informed your work all your all the years you've been making work. It was a huge influence. And I want you well, to talk about the university and Jerry Newman too. Well, that that's a it's a subject that is uh, dear to me. Yes, and it's it is. interesting that as you get older, I don't know other older people, but uh, I don't think that I'm uh, older, but I've been defined as such now. So I have to guess. We're all senior it, citizens at this point, John. We are senior citizens, yes, no question are. about that. But <laughs> but uh, I think you become a real senior citizen when you start to shuffle, but I, I don't shuffle. Yet. <laughs> so uh, so as you get <clears throat> as you get older, you just naturally start to think about your past and your history. And during my 40s and 50s, and when I came to New York in those days, I was in New York, I've lived, been in New York now 43 years, I'm 42 right. years. And <clears throat> in those young days and early days, I kind of left mentally uh, Beaumont and my roots behind. And then as the years went on, and I don't know exactly what triggered it, but it had to be around Lamar. <clears throat> I started getting involved again with the community and with reintroduce re myself to friends. And uh, I think it was the shows I did there or somehow something got me refocused on Beaumont. And then when I did that, I started to relook at everything I'd done as, in fact, really around that big retrospective that the Smithsonian yes. Museum of Fine Arts did. I started yeah. looking at my history and everything about my life. This was 70, 2007. We probably started it in 2006. Mm -hmm. So I had to dig deep into my past, which is going back and reading letters, looking at, at old friendships, borrowing stuff from people I hadn't seen in years. Wow. <clears throat> and then I began to realize that no matter how long I've been in New York, every single thing I do as an artist somehow is is linked to or touches the fiber and fabric of what Jefferson County mm -hmm. and the Sabine River, the Natchez River, and the Gulf of Mexico is. Uh, and my art, there. I've said this before about nature. A lot of painters do work with nature. A lot of painters, mm -hmm. historically, tens of thousands, maybe a few hundred are really good, but nature has always been the teacher and it's uh, important to everyone from Cezanne to the early Renaissance people who use nature scenes in the background. But most nature that you grow up in in the United States, uh, Vermont or Connecticut or wherever, is nature that is very, very uh, unthreatening. But mm -hmm. when you grow up in the swamps of East Texas, I perceived as a little boy camping in the woods and fishing with my father along the Taylor's Bio and Nature's River that around every bend there was something threatening. There were poisonous yeah. spiders, poisonous snakes. We believed that we would be sucked under by quicksand. There were wild boars. And so I looked at nature and its grandeur and its beauty and its haunting beauty to me, but I also looked at it as something else on a human scale that I had to be aware of. It made me aware of nature in a way that people who hike in the Northeast, the most dangerous thing they will ever come across is a tick. And, uh, <laughs> and so, so not an alligator or poison spiders or poison snakes. <laughs> oh yeah. So I looked at nature in a funny, uh, in a different way. And I've always been a nature painter. Even in my figurative work, I based my compositions in my, the structure of the painting off the same formats that I use to organize my, my, my paintings of, of, of the natural world. And it came from immersing myself in that world when I grew up, but it also came from the fact that when I got to Lamar University, something rather significant happened. My father was a very old man and very, very 
we were very, very close. He was born in 1878. Really? We were still in wars in America. And my father fought the Spanish-American War in 1899. Now, all these years later, he lost his son when he was 12 years old. And all these years later, in 1945, he meets my mother and he has another son, me. Well, he's 68 at that time. And so she was 33 and we had an unusual family. But my father was a naturalist and an early version of, a, of an environmentalist. And he really right. taught me to love and appreciate nature. So then my life got sidetracked, as often teenage boys do, ran, ran around with some of the wrong people or whatever. And I, my father died when I was 19 years old. And it was a ah. horrible thing. Any of you out there who've lost a parent in your teen years know. Well, I was really lost after that. I'm and sure you were a man not. came into my life. Uh, a professor, J Jerry Newman, at Lamar. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, he saw something in me that he treated me different than the other students. He was much tougher on me. He was more rigid with me. He was almost like a marine drill instructor. But he was determined to teach me the fundamentals, the fundamentals of art in terms of how to see, how to draw, how to use your materials, how to organize compositions, how to understand and use color. And he was very academic and very rigid, but not only with, with my work, he was like that. He was like that with me as a person. And he, told, he taught me very early and very quick because I, I had great respect for him, that if I was gonna succeed as a man, I had, to, I had to take myself seriously and I had to change my life and become a man. And, and that meant take everything you do seriously and, and become a different human being. Mm -hmm. Now that had to, the only thing I had to get me out of in to the next level of, the, of being a, a, a successful person was my art. Ah. And, and I, I learned so much about not only how to be an artist, and make art, but also how to be a professional and how to conduct myself as a professional. And because of that, my entire 50 something years since has, I've always, I never can turn a young person down that wants to come to the studio or return, I return their letters I, because I've always felt like that it's important for young people to have teachers. That's why the universities, the good art schools and good disciplined schools are so important to the educational system. Because I believe that art is not, it's not a frivolous matter. It's a matter in which uh, people that are successful at it have to take it very, very seriously. And they have to have a purpose. And you have to, to as a young person, because I'm saying all this because I'm, I've heard that there are a lot of students tuning in mm -hmm. is you you have to be kind of undaunted and I knew early on at a time moving into the the big time art or whatever that is uh, that it was the time of conceptualism minimalism color field art and I, it was art that ha I had no interest in that and so I was kind of left out of the early success because I was really a naturalist and a nature painter. And I was very interested in working with the flora and fauna of the land I loved and the place I came from. So that defined me as a young person. Uh -huh. And then when you speak of courage, in the height of when I finally started to get some success in regionally and locally in Houston, I picked up and left and moved to New York. Why did and you move every, to Houston? Why, what was it that brought you to Houston? I know you taught oh, it. I, got a, well, I, I knew that because even though, as you know so well, there were so few galleries there. True. But there were. <laughs> and, and I knew that that was a place where I could make money. And yes. I was going to make you it was doing but, quite well but, in those days, as I remember. We all opened around 1973 and 75 in those days. Well, that what really did it, actually, now that I think about it, 
about uh -huh. your question is I was a graduate student at SMU and yes. a, a professor of mine, uh, and it gets me to another point I want to make, but a professor of mine named Dan Wingren. Oh, yes, I know. A wonderful him. painter from the 50s. That's he right. showed at Mayor's Law. Uh -huh. And one day he asked me if I would, show, if, if it would be all right if he wanted, if he showed my work to Meredith. Well, Meredith was like a big icon because he showed Winslow Homer and Sargent oh, and all these great American paintings. Great deal, like by far. Having to show at the Louvre for me at that time. Of so course. I was, I said yes. So I drove down from Dallas with my paintings in the back of the truck, of El Camino to be exact. And <laughs> Meredith came out of the gallery with his tennis outfit on. Uh -huh. He walked and looked in the back of my truck. I pulled the tarp off, and he looked around the truck for a while. I was scared to death. My, my legs were shaking. <laughs> and he said, he yelled out to some assistant inside. He said, take these paintings inside. I went, whoa. <laughs> and he kept them. And that was the beginning of a long friendship and a long... And, but that was also helped by another generous person who kind of was a mentor and a dear friend. And, and that is the, the, our dear, dear friend, the, the great Richard Stout, who just passed away this past yeah. week. Richard was there at Meredith's and he was a friend of Dan Wingren's and Richard helped with that. And then Richard helped me get a job and asked me if I would go to work at the Museum of Fine Arts. I mean, I'm sorry, at the University of Houston. So that got me to Houston. That, that's a long-winded answer, but that's what happened. You realize that Richard was the one that got you to Houston. Well, he spoke very highly of me to Meredith. Uh -huh. We went to the same junior high school in Beaumont. We both went to Davy Crockett Junior High School. Well, I remember we that Richard had, here. We had Miss Fanny Jones as our teacher. <laughs> I love that. Fanny Jones. <laughs> Fanny Jones. <laughs> So you taught at U of H how long, John? From 71 through 79, but George Bunker, the marvelous dear oh, he man was the head, yeah, he, he paid was... me till 80. He did? <laughs> so I was like a long distance teacher. I, I, I was paid <laughs> through the fall, uh, the summer of 80, mm -hmm. but I, I, was, I really had moved to New York at the end Let of the Let me summer. ask you this. There was a time, as I remember, didn't you show with Max Hutchinson Gallery also and Janie C. Lee in Houston? Se oh, I don't know the of that. 78, 79. I did my first show in New York with Max uh -huh. in 1977. Still right. teaching at the university. Then uh -huh. I did a show with him at the uh, gallery in, on Alabama. In yeah, he opened up a space there for a while, I remember. Yes. That. Miss Susan McShane, rest her soul, bought a giant painting, the first big painting I ever did, 22 feet long. And it's in the Houston Convention Center now. Yeah. Now, she was a, a then, patron, wonderful. Did, oh, gosh. Wonderful. Was great. Then I did, uh, by 79, I'd realized that if I was going to take that next big step, I had to move to New York. And I, and I wanted to. Of course you and did. I, but I, but when I came to New York, that gets us to something like Davy Jones' locker. Yes. I was painting landscapes in Houston and in East Texas. But mm -hmm. when I came to New York, my life changed so dramatically because there was no, I was in a loft in Soho. And that was your first birds, space there? Yeah, I had the same space for 41 years. I remember so that I had, instead of hoot owls and, and blue jays and herons and alligators, mm -hmm. I had sirens and people screaming outside and drunk and homeless people and endless noise. And yeah. so my work became shattered and I had to turn inward. I didn't know I was lost. So I started making these paintings instead of making them from observation, which I'd already always done. Right. I started painting late at night and, and painting out of the kind of the depths of my psyche and Right. A subconscious even. And I, mm -hmm. that's when these strange paintings that had all this uh, crazy stuff going on. That's where well, I, remember those. I remember those paintings, too. And when did Can the I tell you a quick story about Davy Jones' locker? Yeah, I'd love to hear it. I went to this. 
I have to tell it really quickly. I went to this movie set a friend of mine was making in Jamaica. It was a funny movie that was a total flop called Club Paradise. And it had a big cast of great stars, it was starring <clears throat> Robin Williams and some great, but there was a battle scene in it and the Jamaican military was supposed to come flying in with parachutes in this battle scene, it was a comedy. Uh -huh. But something went horribly wrong and there were seven of them who jumped out of the helicopters and two went into the jungle, one missed the beach entirely, landed in the parking lot and, and two of them went into a lagoon next to where the scene was being shot and wouldn't you know one of the poor souls was eaten by like a 10 foot tiger shark. Oh my so god. There was, believe me, it really ah. threw a Oh yes. Monkey wrench into the this movie. Yes. So the next morning they were desperate because they were searching for the guy and the, the lead stunt man on the film asked if anybody could well, had scuba training. So I thought, hmm, well I don't, but how how difficult can it be? So didn't me. So I had Dan no. Rizzi. Dan Rizzi was there. He actually was certified. <laughs> So I went to Jamaican guy Rasta uh -huh. and he gave me 45 minutes of instruction. And I went down looking for this body with oh, this poor John. guys and Rizzy. And you have 45 minutes of air in the tank. And I got down to about 30, 40 feet and a buzzer went off and I was terrified. And, and the, one of the divers came over, I was, and uh, he ch told me to go up. I'd run out of air. I was so scared. I was. I'd run out of air going up. I mean, that's why I had to go up. And I got back to New York after this harrowing experience, and I painted Davy Jones's locker. Well, I can see why that was the inspiration for this painting behind well, me. and also it's Davy <laughs> Jones. I, mean, I felt like I, I was literally <laughs> not going to ever make it from the, well, the no. depths of that place. And that's kind of what it looked like to me when I got back to New York in my mind. What started all the political satire paintings? Tell me about some of those, because I always thought they were so powerful as well. I know it comes from being in New York, but there's some stories behind well, that. It really started, uh, it really started in, in uh, the McLean Gallery. Uh, we're going to do this show. Uh, Bob's generously uh, agreed to do this show. It was mm -hmm. going to cost a lot of money because we're going to, have to borrow all this stuff. But we're right. going to do an exhibition, hopefully in the next year, but then put back now because of this tragedy. But we're going to do my work in the '70s in Texas, '70 to '80, and we're going to do this big fabulous. show. And so, what's triggered it all was this series of drawings I did called "Mr. Friend the Cat." I remember that. 1976 those. and. Uh, and it was a very politically charged year. Gerald Ford was running for president. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very difficult time uh, politically. And I decided to paint this draw, this series of drawings between this my, my cat, Mr. Friend, and these fictional monsters. And it was these battle scenes. And it was just done almost like in some crazy way. But they caught on. And everybody loved them except Meredith. And, and, uh, <laughs> what so that he started, he just thought they were frivolous and, and mm -hmm. crazy. But uh -huh. I've got to tell you, that changed everything. Because from that point on, it seemed like almost everything I did had a political edge to it, even my mm -hmm. landscapes. Mm -hmm. And as the years went on, I, I became so much more immersed in the environmental stuff. Right. It's just, uh, it, it of course. my life. Of course. You know, does. here where we are, I have a, I was out in the yard the other day and there's no noise. There's no traffic. There's no airplanes. No. It's just the no. strangest feeling there. Occasionally you'll hear an ambulance taking someone to Southampton Hospital off in the distance. But you can hear the waves. You can hear the breeze. Right. And I was standing out by my pond and I heard this buzzing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what is this? And it, and I looked in this pussy willow tree that's by the pond. It was covered with honeybees. Oh, my heavens. And I thought, I haven't ah. seen a honeybee on this property in five years. 
I haven't seen the frogs that used to be there. I haven't seen wasps or yellow jackets because they spray so much pesticide here yes, in this right. community to kill ticks and to kill yeah. mosquitoes. God forbid the rich will not allow mosquitoes in their property. So they spray like crazy. Well, because of this horrible virus and this horrible right. thing, one of the yeah. good things that's come out of it is they've shut the spraying down for now. Well, so you know, spring, there's an unbelievable amount of butterflies and bees and, yes. and yellow jackets and all these things, tree frogs that had kind of disappeared because mm -hmm. they're not spraying. And yeah. so, but uh, it is really astounding. Uh, so how what is, how are you life. doing in your studio? I mean, I know that all of this, um, the one thing about being an artist, there are no silver linings in this, but there is this thing about artists making work. It is a solitary activity. Always has been. Painters, Peter, the writers, whatever. Uh, it's a solitary activity. How is this affecting your work at this point, John? Do you see? I know that you, you and I were talking earlier about one time that you go on your computer now a lot and you go and do these virtual, uh, you know, tours of the museums and the paintings that have influenced you over the years, and you're seeing new things that way. What, what, uh, what is, what is influencing you these days? What are you thinking about when you're in the studio and working? Well, I've, I've oddly enough, even before the virus, uh -huh. uh, I was, I've been spending all this time looking back at history, right? And, uh, because of Google and. Uh, this app called cultural arts i think it's called you yeah. can go on these apps and you can do virtual tours of museums mm -hmm. and this particular one and you can see the most highly high resolution images of great paintings so you can take a put a rembrandt in if or whoever you want van gogh who i've been thinking about a lot lately uh -huh. and you, and you zoom in on the Ah, you can see such clarity and the color is extremely good. And I've been taking artists that I never thought about a lot over the years and immersing myself in who they were and their lives. Because we think we know about artists, but mm -hmm. we really don't know much about them. And okay. you can take any one of them. They're interesting. Uh, they're, there's so many marvelous life stories associated with them and you can learn about what made them tick where did their imagery come from mm -hmm. but the one thing all the older ones had in common and i try to stress this with the university uh as universities that i speak at or whatever right. is they all had skill sets yes when i teach or talk to young people there's a thing that i try to talk about which is a triangle and the triangle has equal sides. And at the top of the triangle is, let's say, your eye. The side of the triangle is your brain. And the other side of the triangle is your hand. So your, your hand, I mean, your eye can see something it finds fascinating. Whether this has been a, uh, an event or a sunset or a particular tree or a, something fascinating to the eye that, they want, that you want to make art about or the brain can perceive this in its own way, or you can be laying in a dark room at night trying to sleep and your brain will come up with something. And that's brilliant to you. And you write it down, you make a note. Right. So all this is paramount in making interesting art. But these two are completely irrelevant if the hand doesn't have the skill sets to execute that. Because then what you have is an art fan. Yes. <laughs> you know, no, I understand totally. I do. You don't I do. have great art. And you, <laughs> all great artists until the last 30, 40 years had these skill sets. Yes. And I think it's, I'm, I preach this, it's the, it's the duty and the, the job of the universities and our educational systems to teach people skill sets. And no. it can be taught. Yeah. I'm not telling we're not telling them what to make as artists. We're telling mm -hmm. them how to make it if they want to. And and uh, that I, I still I stand up still lost myself. I have over there a a big old limb kind of half 
full of mold and stuff that from the tree with some cherry blossoms on it that I'm trying to figure out how to just do a study of just not because it's uh, any great idea. It's just, it trains my eye. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think what, what I want to do is because I know Juan had said some of the people might want to see my studio. I've never it's really great. shown this studio. It's built in 1700s and it's uh, one of the oldest buildings on Long Island, but I, I, I'm gonna move my crudely assembled. I think that uh, would be a, a lovely thing. My to crudely assembled uh, camera work here and, and just switch it a little bit and see another part. Let's see how, what that looks like. And okay. also after we do this, we have a few questions from the audience. Oh, good. Too, so. Oh, that's Thank a blackboard back there that my father made for me when I was about five or six years old in elementary oh school. And I've kept it ever since. And I write meaningless dribble on it all the time. And that's an outboard motor that I bought from made in the 1940s. I don't know why it's there. And then this is the command center over there, the office. <laughs> and, oh, uh, yes. In fact, one then, of the uh, questions that we have, uh, Bell asked, how do you manage both the business side and the artistic side of your business? Who asked? There's a, a question from a, someone named Bell who asks, oh, Bell. Oh, okay. um, how do Thank you manage you. both the business side and the artistic side of your business? Well, I know you've got some great dealers that handle a lot of the now business. Side. I, kind of, <laughs> the I kind of trust my dealers. I, yes, you've got I, good ones. I, I, I do. You've got Robert McLean in Houston and Arthur Roger and, and John Bergruen. And well, I'm sure I, I do. You know, I've, I made a decision when I left the Marlboro Gallery back in the 1999, 2000. Was it that, that long ago? I remember yeah, when you were there. That I would not, the money was not enough to, for my, as I moved forward in life, to, mm -hmm. to work with people I didn't like. I think and that I makes didn't feel comfortable with. Yes. And everybody that I work with and associate with and respect, like yourself, are people that I, I I always like to come see. I like to be around. I like to share mm -hmm. stories with, and I like mm -hmm. to learn from. Right. And I think that when you have a an art, when you're involved with a business side of it, if you have someone that's that you can trust and and feel comfortable with, mm -hmm. and it's not always about the money. Uh, no, it has oh, to do with the relationship is established of trust and um, yes. so that goes I've, on. I've learned because I started out so humbly mm -hmm. uh, in, in my beginnings as an artist, and it took, well, slowly worked my way uh, up to bigger shows and more shows. And uh, I learned a lot on, on the way. I, it's like an NFL player or a basketball player who played for like, 12 or 15 teams. Uh -huh. You just learn a lot from everybody. Well, and I've first, always been a good listener when it comes to that, or a, not a listener, but an observer. And uh, so that, that, but you have to, it, to answer the question now, one thing that I urge young people is be patient. Mm -hmm. I know sometimes you see these young people your age and your colleagues or whatever uh, that just soar to, great heights and their paintings begin to bring great amounts of money uh, more often than not far more than me. And yet they've never had a museum show or they, but they're, it's just, the money drives the art world, man. That's a dangerous, awful thing, yes. but don't be impatient. It, it takes time to get, first of all, you have to build a, a body of work. I tell every young artist that I go talk to or see their studio, Almost inevitably, you go in there and there's, you know this because you look at a lot more artists than I, I do. Work you go in there, there and you go, me. where's the work? Yeah. And exactly. they have, well, I've got these three, two paintings here. And that. I mean, my studio, when I was always in the city, it's not so much out here, I'm just starting now. But my studio is full of stuff all the time. I'm and sure. uh, some of it's not very good. 
some of it is. Well, John, you've but always worked, been a force of nature, though. You've always been energetic, and you've always had ideas going. You've never stopped working on these years you're driven by. But to answer her question again some more is get advice mm -hmm. from people you trust and be patient. And the, the most important thing is paramount is you have to put a body of work together. Not a few pictures, a body of work. Because art dealers, and I certainly don't want to speak for you, art dealers, when they go to a new person, they want to see a body of work that the dealer can perceive. How would this look in my gallery? Absolutely. No, you, you're right on. I agree with you. I don't you. care that you painted a beautiful portrait of your Aunt no. Jane and her dachshund doll. <laughs> if you've got a whole room full of those things, all of a sudden something weird and magic might come out of it. That's right. And then you got That's Alice right. Neal or something. That's right. I love questions. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask you, like, we're going to look at another area here. I'm going to show you my, <laughs> I'm going to show you my old pot belly stove here. That is the okay. Only thing. <laughs> As I asked, one of the things I asked John earlier was that he's got 20 some odd put ceilings in this studio. There's, and there's the fire in there. Warm in the wintertime. That's, that's and, pretty. Uh, this so is John, the drawing area over here, I think. That's the one start of, the of another big one. things that I wanted and to. This door. I'm sorry, Betty. I wanted to discuss that one of the uh, things. I've, of course, you're known as a consummate painter. But also, your works on paper are so alive and so intimate and so beautiful. You have such an intimate knowledge of the subject matter that you draw. And I've always thought that drawing was kind of the soul of most artists. Um, it's where it comes from. What are your thoughts on that? Because you draw thank you, for, thank you for asking that because I wanted to talk about it, but I forgot. Okay. Uh, and that <laughs> well, is... I'm glad uh, I thought of asking you that. I think that of all the things you can do as an uh -huh. artist, a young artist or an old artist, yeah. to train your eye, to train your thought process, and to keep you moving forward in your development. And let's hope that if you live to be my age in your right. mid-70s, that you're still growing. And yeah. I try, I think I am, I try. And it, it all gets back to drawing. But I used to say to my students when I taught years ago that if you're capable of taking your finger and touching your nose, uh, you're coordinated enough to be taught drawing. I'm not so sure about and that. I think there's a you gift can't be taught to be an artist and draw, no. but you can be taught to draw better. Let me put it that way. There's a great so Terry you, Allen song about drawing a horse or a sausage. So anyway, go ahead. Terry Allen. <laughs> oh, I know. He's a... But you know, yeah. Terry but Allen is but one he, of the greatest draftsmen of our time. Yeah, true. But talk and about Terry is, Terry is such a lovely performer and sculptor, and he's he's got so many more disciplines and so much more talent than I do. That's he, well, he it's, was, a, it's apples and oranges, no, though, John. You are a consummate painter and uh, do drawings that are just. Absolutely exquisite. I remember that show you had at the Art Museum of Southeast Texas, 35 years of drawing. That's a memorable exhibition. It was a Well, huge. I don't have it here, but I'm working on a drawing in uh, uh, in the city that's, I uh -huh. hope I get it done. It's, it's going to be a, a, well, there's a drawing at the Bowman Art Museum that's eight feet long of a, of a I know that. I know that. I'm doing a giant buffalo. Oh, wow. I don't know why. A giant uh, buffalo. But, but drawing what? is, speaking, going back to what you said about looking at other artists, though, so yeah. I, I don't, never does a week go by that I don't literally look at other drawings. I mean, uh -huh. if you want to have a, a nice evening, go online with the, that Arts and Culture app and look at the drawings of George Surratt. Oh. He's not a well-known for his drawings, but he is one of the greatest draftsmen ever, and they're so different, and they're so... Magical. You find I'm learn. terrified, Betty. I mean, I have to say, what? I want to say this. I'm I'm terrified that uh, our universities, uh, not all of them, but too many, are are getting away from that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some kind of misguided belief uh, that that, and I call it also lazy that the direction that they want to take these 
art departments is in the direction of digital art. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, John, it's true. And that has a place in art making. I'm not but saying it doesn't have a place. It always comes back to painting and drawing that a lot. You know, we've had trends. You and I have seen so many trends come and go during our lifetimes and our careers in art in this 50 years. And look how many times the painting and drawing still is the center of it all. And it remains to be that way, it seems like. Well, I, I've done several big universities in the last, say, two or three years. Mm -hmm. that I just go, you know, be a brief guest there. And every single one of them that I've been to, there's a much greater emphasis on and need for drawing and painting teachers than yes, any time I've ever seen. And all these young people that are going to these, whether it's just some school in the South or if it's a big school in the Northeast or California, they all want to learn drawing and painting now. Yes, they do. And that's why the New York Academy in New York is so popular. There's, it's the waiting list to get in that school is enormous. And they have the biggest success rate placing their students of any school in America, except maybe Yale. And that, and it's because they teach you the fundamentals of making art. I have a question. Our universities get away from that. We're doomed. We have a question from Shannon. And she asked, of all the pieces you've painted, which is your most favorite? And that's going to be a tough one to answer. It's yeah, whatever you're working there, on right there's now. There's so many different reasons for each one. Of course there uh, is. I think one of my favorites, I don't know why, I think one of them is this painting called Glory Bound that was in the Houston show and mm -hmm. uh, and in the Smithsonian. It's a 10 foot painting of an old 1950s locomotive coming through yes. a South it's American a jungle. Show. That was and a fact. All these frightened birds and terrified little creatures. And it's yeah. this old iron locomotive coming at you, breathing smoke and fire. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of an environmentally conscious statement painting and yes, I, i'm yes, very indeed. moved by that when i think about it and mm -hmm. i think one of my favorites is an obvious one which is the ship of fools which is a ship of fools is classic the smithsonian that was yeah. that was that boat based on hieronymus bosch yeah. great ship of fools painting it was a combination of this is how i do things sometimes i had this idea and i wanted to make it I perceived how I wanted to make it because I had a whole series of little drawings that we're mm -hmm. going to show all of those little drawings uh, mm -hmm. in the uh, at, when we do this big kind of thing at McLean from uh -huh. our sketchbooks. And way wow. back, I had all these little sketches of these boats filled with these kind of weird looking people. Mm -hmm. So then it kind of lay, lay around for years and never went anywhere. Then I saw this Hieronymus Bosch and I brought it back to life and and then we were getting into some very troubled times and uh, politically again the, yeah. the Iraq war right terrorism 9-11 whatever right and so I decided that I wanted to make a painting about leadership and what great need it was to have competent leaders and so I made this boatload of what I call fools mm -hmm. and that nobody's identifiable. I put masks on them and they're all, a lot of them are just pigs. And uh, there's a lot of money floating out of the boat and flying around. That's, a fabulous uh, that's one of my favorites. Powerful. Thank you for asking. No, it's a powerful painting too. I agree. There's another question from Karen and she says, what are the main differences between your early work and your current work? So how would you answer that question? It's changed so many times over the years. I mean, there's a... Well, I can, I, I can tell you what the similarity is. Okay, that's a good way to I'm looking at this painting uh, over that I'm working on now, and I'll turn this thing around where we can actually see it if you want to. I I'd feel, love to. I feel so strange talking about all this stuff because in this time of such struggle and strife, I, I, I want to try to make you all understand, even though I'm losing myself and talking about my work, I know we're all in this together right now. And we're we all kind of, when I walk out that door after I leave here, my blood pressure will go up 
15 points because just going out the door scares me. Of I'm course only, it does. I'm only not afraid when I'm in here. It's a, it's the strangest feeling. I've never uh -huh. been afraid. I was a volunteer fireman for 25 years. I've been mm -hmm. in many burning buildings and pulled people out of car wrecks and done all kinds of strange stuff. And nothing has ever rattled me like this last month. Of course not. It's and terrifying. We're all it is terrifying. I'm sure it is. And I know so many of you out there are, and I, and I send you my love and I send you my warmth and prayers or whatever. I just, uh, so many are so much worse than me. Two of my doctors have. It. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, you want to call, want to call the doctor about a prescription refill. Oh no, he's got it. I mean, it's yeah. anyway. But I'm glad you're bless you all. That's all I want to say. But what was the question? <laughs> There's the main difference between your early oh, work and no, your current work. You. Oh, yes, I've got a great, I've got an answer for that. Okay, um, you have an answer for that. The one thing that is always there, mm -hmm. it goes back to the earliest days of Jerry Newman, and that is a structural, pictorial, compositional organization. So I always started drawings and painting with a blank canvas or a treated blank canvas with a tone, but it's a big empty canvas or a big empty piece of paper. I started with an idea, but then the first thing is like a composite, like building a building. You have to have a structure and a foundation to put any bricks or windows or awnings on. And so you have to have a structure. And my structures, even in my figurative works and in my landscapes and in my complex kind of psychoanalytic crazy drawings from the 80s and paintings, I've always uh, based my compositions on the interweaving of sticks and twine, I mean, logs and vines and flora and fauna of the Southeast Texas bayous and, and Gulf Coast. And that compositional structure, it permeates everything today. Uh, ah. gonna, in fact, to help answer maybe that young lady's question, I don't know if she's young or not, she may be, yes. is where the hell is this thing? All right. I've got this old <laughs> chip off of here. I'm sliding this Bloody. ball off of it. Do you have the picture in there or is not? Nope. No, not yet. We don't see the picture yet. I know he's, John's Is that gonna... a picture? I see the I see the herons in the back. It's a beautiful okay, thing. There it is. Now, yeah, right? We can see we can see like a two thirds of it. This is oh. sticks and vines that I bring in from outside. That whole area is ah. is caught up with this. See, like this is a log with a vine around right. it, and so. What I do, I got my Tex Joy coffee hat here, by the way. Okay, uh, good. What I do is, uh, is I put together these, the, the, these, these compositions. Yes. Is that is that better? Yeah, we can see the painting now. We can see the painting well, and then the sticks to right, the right. So you side. see the, the elements. See the elements. Bring in sure. nature, but these for, these formal compositions come from. Literally, uh, direct observation and working from life in, uh, in, in fishing and camping trips and just pleasure trips up and down the, the bayous and creeks and, and uh, rivers of, of yes. uh, the, the surrounding area of Beaumont. See, I've and heard it, of all the stories about you and Paul Manus and Kim oh, we and Steinhagen and all these adventures y'all have had around the Bird oh, yeah, we, it's a miracle we are actually alive. We should all be sure. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Good memories for that, I'm sure. But uh, it's it's a it's a very uh, it's it's a very nice opportunity to me to to think about something else uh, for this period that we are talking and yes. and uh, and to share. I don't know some personal side of my life that's I don't normally share with with people and uh, I, I, I think I feel so raw right now because 
of course what's you going do. on around me that uh, I feel compelled to talk. I mean, if I if what I've said tonight, if one one percent of it or five percent of it or, or ten or whatever gets through and helps a young person, inspires a young person, or gives them some idea, uh, or gives them a sense of security that it is a long haul and it is a difficult challenge to be an artist, then I feel like I've, I've touched something or somebody, and I hope I've been a distraction for this period from uh, the, the, the gloom, which is government. No, this I think has just been a marvelous evening with you, John, without a doubt. Uh, we're all uh, about to go into a brave new world when this virus has finished its course, and uh, none of us know what that is going to be like. We certainly don't in the profession that you and I are in. It's going to change our profession as it does everybody's, uh, in everybody's life in a way. In the meantime, you are making extraordinary paintings, and uh, you've done so much to enrich people's lives over the years. I can't well, thank you would, for that. Well, it's, it's wonderful for you to say that about me, but, but it's, it's also true. important that I say that about you because you've been one of the most philanthropic and generous <laughs> dealers and what you've done with community involvement and your support of the arts in Texas and not just Houston, but Texas and well, the, the whole area has been un it's just been unbelievable and, you, and you've been a mentor. love this kind of business that you and i are both in it's a love we've got and it's something that we'll keep on hopefully loving and sharing with other people and i can't thank you enough for being so honest with us tonight and sharing your views about oh. your life and everything no it's been fascinating and i'm sure all the viewers out there feel the same way so and it's been good with you dear friend oh god i think it's I'm true. really just, uh, I'm very happy that we had an opportunity to do this. Me and too, uh, I kind of was all over the place, but I wish. Uh, no, you were great tonight. And Juan's going to switch seats with me right now, okay? Who? Juan is going to sit in this chair. Bye, John. Well, I want to say hello and uh, send my love to all the alumni that oh, are yes. out there that have gone to school and all the young artists that are going to school. And feel free to write me or text me or whatever if you have a, you know, if, if you're if you're pursuing this business and this career, I'm 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 always uh, take a moment to try to help you if I can. You're and, good. Uh, man. Maybe you're I can't, good but at least I'll try. Well, here's one, and thank you, John, so much. Betty, I love you. Love you too, John. Take care of yourself. Bye bye. Stay well and stay safe. All right. Well, thank you, John. Um, thank you, everybody who joined us this evening. Um, the video goes on our website, and so people can, can look at it later. Um, if you do have questions of John, especially if you're one of our students, my goodness, take him up on this. And you can email us at alumni at lamar.edu, and we'll communicate to John on your behalf. John, we owe you, again, you're a good friend of this institution, and thank you for taking this time. Well, it, it, it was it was very important to my life, and I would be happy to do anything I can for it. But I want to remind everybody tonight, social distancing, but also go outside and look because it's a big, full supermoon, and it might put a smile on your face, and uh, it'll give you something beautiful to look at. That's, that's a good way to end it, John. That's a perfect right. way to end it. Bye-bye, everyone. Goodbye. And, and just so everybody knows, Daniel will now play our ad at the end of this. John, thank you again. We owe you. Take care. I want to help people. I want to be a part of the solutions of tomorrow. I want to bring innovations in times of need. I want to turn my passion for helping others into action. I want to be the voice that shares truth with the world. In times of uncertainty, being a nurse is how I will make a difference. My professors have taught me human resources is about putting people first. Through the power of mechanical engineering, I've learned how to better the world around me. Because of Lamar University, I've been given the opportunity to change my world. To change our world. Our moment is here. 
Our moment is now. Make the most of it at Lamar University.